Chapter 19 of Tales of the Enchanted Islands of the Atlantic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Asterix. Tales of the Enchanted Islands of the Atlantic by Thomas Higginson. Chapter 19 the island of demons those american travellers who linger with delight among the narrow lanes and picturesque overhanging roofs of honfleur do not know what a strange tragedy took place on a voyage which began in that quaint old port three centuries and a half ago when in fifteen thirty six the breton sailor jacques cartier returned from his early explorations of the st lawrence which he had ascended as high as hochelaga king francis i sent for him at the lofty old house known as the house of the salamander in a narrow street of the quaint town of lisieux it now seems incredible that the most powerful king in europe should have dwelt in such a meagre lane yet the house still stands there as a witness although a visitor must now brush away the rough ready-made garments and fishermen's overalls which overhang its door over that stairway nevertheless the troubadours pierre ronsard and clement marot used to go up and down, humming their lays or touching their viols. And through that door, Delorge returned in glory after leaping down into the lion's den to rescue his lady's glove. The house still derives its name from the great carved image of a reptile which stretches down its outer wall, from garret to cellar beside the doorway. In that house, the great king deigned to meet the Breton sailor, who had set up along the St. Lawrence a cross bearing the arms of France with the inscription Franciscus Primus Dei Gratia Francorum Rex Regnat, and had followed up the pious act by kidnapping the King Donnacona and carrying him back to France. This savage potentate was himself brought to Lisieux to see his French fellow sovereign, and the jovial king, eagerly convinced, decided to send Cartier forth again to explore for other wonders and perhaps bring back other kingly brethren. Meanwhile, however, as it was getting to be an affair of royalty, he decided to send also a gentleman of higher grade than a pilot, and so selected Jean-Francois de la Roche, Sieur de Roberval, whom he commissioned as lieutenant and governor of Canada and Hochelaga. Roberval was a gentleman of credit and renown in Picardy, and was sometimes jocosely called by Francis the little king of Vimeux. He was commissioned at Fontainebleau and proceeded to superintend the building of ships at St. Malo. Marguerite Roberval, his fair-haired and black-eyed niece, was to go with him on the voyage with other ladies of high birth, and also with the widowed Madame de Noailles, her gouvernante. Roberval himself remained at St. Malo to superintend the building of the ships, and Marguerite and her gouvernante would sit for hours in a beautiful nook by the shipyards, where they could overlook the vessels in rapid construction, or else watch the wondrous swirl of the tide as it swept in and out, leaving the harbour bare at low tide but with eight fathoms of water when the tide was full. The designer of the ships often came cap in hand to ask or answer questions. One of those frank and manly French fishermen and pilots whom the French novelists describe as un solide gaillard, or such as Victor Hugo paints in his Les Travailleurs de la Mer. The son of a notary, Etienne Gosselin, was better educated than most of the young noblemen whom Marguerite knew, and only his passion for the sea and for nautical construction had kept him a shipbuilder. No wonder that the young Marguerite, who had led the sheltered life of the French maiden, 
was attracted by his manly look, his open face, his merry blue eyes and curly hair. There was about her a tinge of romance, which made her heart an easier thing to reach for such a lover than for one within her own grade. And as the voyage itself was a world of romance, a little more or less of the romantic was an easy thing to add. Meanwhile, Madame de Noailles read her breviary and told her beads and took little naps, wholly ignorant of the drama that was beginning its perilous unfolding before her. When the Sieur de Roberval returned, the shipbuilder became a mere shipbuilder again. Three tall ships sailed from Honfleur on August the 22nd, 1541, and on one of them, La Grande Hermine, so called to distinguish it from a smaller boat of that name, which had previously sailed with Cartier, were the Sieur de Roberval, his niece, and her gouvernante she also had with her a huguenot nurse who had been with her from a child and cared for her devotedly roberval naturally took with him for future needs the best shipbuilder of st malo etienne gosselin the voyage was long and there is reason to think that the sieur de roberval was not a good sailor while as to the gouvernante she may have been as helpless as the seasick chaperon of yachting excursions like them she suffered the most important events to pass unobserved and it was not till too late that she discovered what more censorious old ladies on board had already seen that her young charge lingered too often and too long on the quarter-deck when etienne gosselin was planning ships for the uncle when she found it out she was roused to just indignation but being after all but a kindly dowager with a heart softened by much reading of the interminable tales of madame de scudery she only remonstrated with marguerite wept over her little romance and threatened to break the sad news to the sieur de roberval yet never did so other ladies were less considerate it all broke suddenly upon the angry uncle the youth was put in irons and threatened with flogging and forbidden to approach the quarter-deck again but love laughs at locksmiths gosselin was relieved of his irons in a day or two because he could not be spared from his work in designing the forthcoming ship and as both he and marguerite were of a tolerably determined nature they invoked through the old nurse the aid of a huguenot minister on board who had before sailed with cartier to take charge of the souls of some protestant vagabonds on the ship and who was now making a second trip for the same reason that night after dark he joined the lovers in marriage within twenty-four hours roberval had heard of it and had vowed a vengeance quick and sure the next morning, under his orders, the vessel lay to under the lee of a rocky island, then known to the sailors as l'île des démons, from the fierce winds that raged round it. There was no house there, no living person, no tradition of any, only rocks, sands, and deep forests. With dismay, the ship's company heard that it was the firm purpose of Roberval to put the offending bride on shore giving her only the old nurse for company and there to leave her with provisions for three months trusting to some other vessel to take the exiled women away within that time the very ladies whose love of scandal had first revealed to him the alleged familiarities now besought him with many tears to abandon the thought of a doom so terrible vainly madame de noailles implored mercy for the young girl from a penalty such as was never imposed in any of Madame de Scudery's romances. Vainly the Huguenot minister and the Catholic chaplain, who had fought steadily on questions of doctrine during the whole voyage, now united in appeals for pardon. At least they implored him to let the offenders have a manservant or two with them to protect them against wild beasts or buccaneers he utterly refused until at last wearied out his wild nature yielded 
to one of those sudden impulses which were wont to sweep over it, and he exclaimed, Is it that they need a manservant then? Let this insolent caitiff, Gosselin, be relieved of his irons and sent on shore. Let him be my niece's servant, or, since a Huguenot marriage is as good as any in the presence of bears and buccaneers, let her call the hound her husband if she likes. I have done with her, and the race from which she came disowns her forever. Thus it was done. Etienne was released from his chains and sent on shore. An arquebus and ammunition were given him, and resisting the impulse to send his first shot through the heart of his tyrant, he landed, and the last glimpse seen of the group as the Grand Hermine sailed away was the figure of Marguerite sobbing on his shoulder, and of the unhappy nurse, now somewhat plethoric, and certainly not the person to be selected as a pioneer, sitting upon a rock, weeping profusely. The ship's sails filled. The angry robber Val never looked back on his deserted niece, and the night closed down upon the lonely Isle of Demons, now newly occupied by three unexpected settlers, two of whom, at least, were happy in each other. A few boxes of biscuits, a few bottles of wine, had been put on shore with them, enough to feed them for a few weeks. They had brought flint and steel to strike fire and some ammunition. The chief penalty of the crime did not lie, after all, in the cold and the starvation and the wild beasts and the possible visits of pirates. It lay in the fact that it was the island of demons where they were to be left, and in that superstitious age this meant everything that was terrible. For the first few nights of their stay, they fancied that they heard superhuman voices in every wind that blew, every branch that creaked against another branch, and they heard at any rate more substantial sounds from the nightly wolves or from the bears which ice floes had floated to that northern isle. They watched Roberval sail away, he rejoicing, as the old legend of Teve says, at having punished them without soiling his hands with their blood. Joyeux de les avoir punis sans se les mains en leur sein. They built as best they could a hut of boughs and strewed beds of leaves until they had killed wild beasts enough to prepare their skins. Their store of hard bread lasted them but a little while, but there were fruits around them and there was fresh water nearby. Yet it was terrible, says Teve's old narrative, to hear the frightful sounds which the evil spirits made around them, and how they tried to break down their abode, and showed themselves in various forms of frightful animals. Yet at last, conquered by the constancy and perseverance of these repentant Christians, the tormentors afflicted or disquieted them no more, save that often in the night they heard cries so loud that it seemed as if more than five thousand men were assembled together. Plus de cent mille hommes qui fussent ensemble. So passed many months of desolation, and alas, the husband was the first to yield. Daily he climbed the rocks to look for vessels. Each night he descended, sadder and sadder. He waked while the others slept. Feeling that it was he who had brought distress upon the rest, he concealed his depression. But it soon was past concealing. He only redoubled his care and watching as his wife grew the stronger of the two. And he faded slowly away and died. His wife had nothing to sustain her spirits except the approach of maternity. She would live for her child. When the child was born and baptized in the name of the Holy Church, though without the Church's full ceremonies, Marguerite felt the strength of motherhood, became a better huntress, a better provider. A new sorrow came. In the sixteenth or seventeenth month of her stay, the old nurse died also, and not long after the baby followed. Marguerite now seemed to herself deserted, even by heaven itself. She was alone in that northern island without comradeship, her husband, child, and nurse gone, dependent for very food on the rapidly diminishing supply of ammunition. 
her head swam for months she saw visions almost constantly which only strenuous prayer banished and only the acquired habit of the chase enabled her almost mechanically to secure meat to support life fortunately those especial sights and sounds of demons which had haunted her imagination during the first days and nights on the island did not recur but the wild beasts gathered round her the more when there was only one gun to alarm them and she once shot three bears in a day one a white bear of which she secured the skin what imagination can depict the terrors of those lonely days and still lonelier nights? Most persons left as solitary tenants of an island have dwelt, like Alexander Selkirk, in regions nearer the tropics, where there was at least a softened air, a fertile soil, and the southern cross above their heads. But to be solitary in a prolonged winter, to be alone with the northern lights, this offered peculiar terrors to be ice-bound, to hear the wolves in their long and dreary howl, to protect the very graves of her beloved from being dug up, to watch the floating icebergs, not knowing what new and savage visitor might be borne by them to the island. What a complication of terror was this for Marguerite! For two years and five months in all she dwelt upon the Isle of Demons, the last year wholly alone then as she stood upon the shore some breton fishing smacks seeking codfish came in sight making signals with fire and calling for aid she drew them nearer but she was now dressed in furs only and seemed to them but one of the fancied demons of the island beating up slowly and watchfully toward the shore they came within hearing of her voice and she told her dreary tale at last they took her in charge and bore her back to france with the bearskin she had prepared and taking refuge in the village of nautron in a remote province perigord where she could escape the wrath of roberval she told her story to teve the explorer to the princess marguerite of navarre sister of francis i and to others teve tells it in his cosmographie and marguerite of navarre in her sans nouvelles nouvelles she told teve that after the first two months the demons came to her no more until she was left wholly alone then they renewed their visits but not continuously and she felt less fear teve also records of her this touching confession that when the time came for her to embark in the breton ship for home there came over her a strong impulse to refuse the embarkation but rather to die in that solitary place as her husband her child and her servant had already died this profound touch of human nature does more than anything else to confirm the tale as substantially true certain it is that the lonely island which appeared so long on the old maps as the isle of demons l'isola di demoni appears differently in later ones as the ladies island l'île de la demoiselle the princess marguerite of navarre who died in fifteen forty nine seems also to have known her namesake at her retreat in perigord gives some variations from teve's story and describes her as having been put on shore with her husband because of frauds which he had practised on roberval nor does she speak of the nurse or of the child but she gives a similar description of marguerite's stay on the island after his death and says that although she lived what might seem a bestial life as to her body it was a life wholly angelic as regarded her soul and si vivant quant au corps de vie bestiale et quant à l'esprit de vie angélique she had the princess also says a mind cheerful and content in a body emaciated and half dead she was afterwards received with great honour in france according to the princess and was encouraged to establish a school for little children where she taught reading and writing to the daughters of high-born families and by this honest industry says the princess she supported herself during the remainder of her life having no other wish than to exhort every one to love and confidence towards god 
offering them as an example the great pity which he had shown for her. End of chapter 19